Okay, hey everyone. Uh, we are going to be casually talking through this 2009 English language and comp prompt uh, about the indispensable opposition. All right, this is a rhetorical analysis essay, and we want to make sure, you know, at the, the front of this, we remember what these essays are about. These essays are not about your opinion or how you feel about what is being said. Okay, so it's unique in that sense. It's not really an argument in terms of your beliefs or your reaction. You're analyzing what's happening with the author's argument. So all of the discussion here is not about how you feel, but about what you perceive the author to be doing within the text. Your opinion, I suppose, could sneak in in the intro and the conclusion, perhaps, but it's really irrelevant. And so we have to really intentionally separate ourselves from our, our feelings here or our reaction to the text and really focus on, okay, what's going on in the, in the actual passage. So let's look at the, the actual instructions here. Now, remember, the instructions are always going to be somewhat similar. You're supposed to be, you know, looking at the rhetorical moves or the, uh, the way the author forms his or her argument. But there's always going to be a little bit of variety and you don't want to just gloss over the instructions because sometimes there are specific instructions for for instance in the uh, pink flamingo prompt by price if you've seen that or not I do have videos on that uh, but in that prompt it, it says uh, something about what the author feels about American culture or American ideals so you could be very off topic if you didn't catch that so here it is the passage below is from the indispensable opposition an article by walter Lippmann. it appeared in the atlantic monthly in 1939 read the passage carefully always a good idea good advice then write an essay in which you analyze the rhetorical strategies Lippmann uses to develop his argument so a couple things about this number one there's an assumption of vocabulary and so as one of the things i always push is the more words you know the better off you are you sound smarter, you know more, you can decode more if you work on your vocabulary. So in this case, obviously, you have to know what indispensable means, which is not that difficult uh, because like you, you all know dispensable cups and things like that. So indispensable, the opposite, you can't get rid of it. Opposition, the people that would be against what you think or believe. So the opposition is indispensable. We cannot get rid of that. Uh, interesting, right? Especially uh, oftentimes, and this happens a lot in, in the culture, you look around and, and this is controversial to an extent. Uh, then write an essay which you analyze rhetorical strategies to develop his argument. So number one, you have to figure out what the argument is. And then number two, how does Littman achieve that argument? What does he do, um, Walter, what does he do uh, in order to put forward this argument or develop this argument or construct this argument. And so one of the things as we go through this, remember, uh, obviously the vocabulary decoding and understanding what he's being said is, is crucial, uh, but we have to figure out how are we going to approach this essay. And my recommendation also is you look for the tonal shift. The shift is when the author has been talking in one vein and then moves to another. Um, to do the tonal shift as kind of a key part of decoding this, is to allow yourself to set up an essay <clears throat> in two paragraphs. What is this author uh, developing in terms of argument before the tonal shift and after? Now, might there be more subtle tonal shifts within a passage? Of course there might be. But how many paragraphs do you want to write is the question. Uh, in a limited amount of time in this kind of situation, you're best off trying to figure out, okay, two body paragraphs and an intro and conclusion. Uh, is about all I can handle and still have development in that. So here we go into this passage, and I'm using uh, camiapp.com to, to kind of work on this uh, as I help mark this up, right? I am annotating as I go. I do have annotation videos as well if you're not sure about annotating and what you should be doing, but always we're annotating for the prompt. So in this case, we're looking at uh, the developing argument and how it's achieved. So, were they pressed hard enough, most men would probably confess that political freedom, that is, the right to speak freely and to act in opposition, 
is a noble ideal rather than a practical necessity. So the interesting posit here, what's he putting forth here is like, uh, you know, people would automatically say you should have free speech. People would automatically say that is an ideal. It is a right to be able to speak your mind and to have free speech. But if you really push it, if you really get down to it, um, they would say that's just an ideal. It's not uh, a necessity or it's not always practical. So here, Littman, right, uh, uh, right away here, it is an ideal, not always feasible or practical. So that's his first kind of idea here that people will say that it's important, but when it comes down to it, uh, do they really believe that in all cases? As the case for freedom is generally put today, the argument lends itself to this feeling. It is made to appear that, whereas each man claims his freedom as a matter of right, the freedom he accords to other men is a matter of toleration. All right, so this is another interesting put, uh, thing here, right? Good for me, not always for you. Okay, so it's a hypocrisy here. There's a hypocrisy inherent in this belief in that people will say, I have the right to freedom of speech. I have the right to say what I want. Yet then in practice, right, what happens in practice, you can say what you want uh, as long as, as I can tolerate it, as long as I will put up with it. Okay, so he, he's pointing out uh, the, there's a freedom, is, it's a right. So it's this idea of rights here, right? What is a right versus what is allowable? So and this becomes then personal. The defense of freedom of opinion or freedom of speech, right, you could say, lends to rest not on its substantial, beneficial, and indispensable consequences. In other words, it's not because it's inherently true. It's like, it's not because it is a need, it is a must have, but on a somewhat eccentric, rather vaguely benevolent attachment to an abstraction. So the vocabulary here now, right? The vocabulary is now a little bit of challenging here. Uh, hopefully you know what benevolent is. If you don't, bena always means good or positive. Uh, means very charitable or giving. It's it's this vague notion of I'm being a good person, right? Attachment to an abstraction. So the right to freedom of speech is when it's abstract, right? Not concrete, not definite, is something we all get behind. But when it comes to actual application, that's when it gets hazy where we feel if we're allowing someone to have their opinion, if we're allowing someone to speak their mind, then we are being generous, vaguely generous. Uh, so there's the idea here. So we feel we are being generous by extending our tolerance. So interesting ideas here, right? In other words, this what we tend to say is a, a right to freedom of speech, to freedom of opinion is always extended to us and it's extended to others when we feel that it's tolerable. In other words, we're hypocrites is what he's putting forward here, right? But, and so you always want to be careful, you know, hopefully you're noticing like there's a lot of buts here. He's doing a lot of contrasts here, but, whereas, but. So what's the purpose of these contrasts? He's, he's contrasting the ideals versus the application. That we are one way when it comes to what we say we believe, what we say is a right when we have our ideals, but when it comes to practical everyday discussion, observation, actual application, we, we become uh, less adhered to these principles. So obviously this is a, a quote here from Voltaire. In other words, this was a guiding principle when Voltaire says, I wholly disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So in other words, we can say that, uh, that we believe in that for freedom of speech. It's a way to back up the, the, the right to freedom of speech. But as a matter of fact, most men will not defend to the death the rights of other men. So this feeds into that idea that it is a 
uh, in terms of principle or ideals, it's something that we live up to. However, when it comes down to, to real life and, and practical application, we won't do it. If they disprove sufficiently what other men say, they will somehow suppress those men if they can. Okay, so when it comes to argument in this first passage, right, we might say that this is the conclusion of everything he's been building up here. If they disapprove sufficiently, they will suppress those men if they can. Now, here's the one thing we want to say about interpreting this not from our current perspective, but taking the text as it lay. If this were being written in modern time, you would probably uh, see or comment that, well, why doesn't he say women? Why does he just say men, men, men? Again, this is written in 1939. It's general men, meaning people. We have to get beyond that. Yes, could we argue, well, he should say he or she, or men or women, or just people, or they. Sure, of course. But that's from our perspective in our year. It's irrelevant in what you're supposed to do in this passage. So this is just one of those points. I'm not arguing that he's right or wrong. I'm saying that to go down that, that path uh, of focusing on that is a waste of time and off topic from the prompt. So it's this idea of we don't want to impose our current standards in a rhetorical analysis essay and make some evaluation or the rightness or the wrongness when that has nothing to do with the prompt. Just a piece of advice so you don't shoot yourself in the foot, metaphorically speaking not advocating uh, the use of firearms in any way. So next one. So next thing, we're again, we're getting now almost to the bottom of the column. So your radar might be going off like, ooh, is the tonal shift here? Is this the tonal shift? Well, this is an indication. You have a word like so. So is not a transition word. It is a conclusion word. I believe this so. And so you don't want to necessarily jump the gun and say that we're at the, the tonal shift. So if this is the best that can be said for liberty of opinion, that a man must tolerate his opponents because everyone has a right to say what he pleases, then we shall find that liberty of opinion is a luxury safe only in pleasant times when men can be tolerant because they are not deeply and vitally concerned. So freedom of speech only when safe and convenient so again i'm not this this is my note here i'm not arguing this i'm saying that this is his conclusion here if the best that we can say is that we are just to tolerate people's opinions not you know not listen to them not digest them not take them into consideration well then if that's the the reason we say that it's not necessary it's a luxury right luxury meaning uh not like fancy clothes luxury or expensive cars luxury, it means it's a concession. It's a toleration. It's something that we can do only when the times are not tough, only when the times are not difficult in the culture, for instance. So because they don't really affect us that way. When it comes to, to matters of crucial changes or decision making, that's the point he's making. In those, if we're only saying we're tolerate, tolerate, tolerant, of opinions because we're being generous by allowing people to speak uh, then when things are difficult the, that's the first to go next paragraph yet okay so that's an important word here when we see yet right yet then moves on it is then de digging in a different way so that's kind of one of those words where you're like oh, is this the tonal shift because he's now made this argument that uh, allowing the opposition to freedom of speech is sometimes just a feel-good principle, but when it comes down to it, it's the first to go. It's only how much we'll tolerate it. Then what good is it? Yet, as a matter of historic fact, there is a much stronger foundation for the constitutional right of freedom of speech, the great constitutional right of freedom of speech as an and as a matter of practical human experience there is a much more compelling reason for cultivating the habits of free men reason for freedom of speech 
opinion goes beyond what we'll tolerate, okay? Now remember, he's now introducing uh, kind of the, the, the secondary argument here. So when we talk about pre-tonal shift and post-tonal shift, uh, we can then start to think, okay, is he making a secondary argument here? And if I'm writing a body paragraph, everything before this point uh, would be one body paragraph, and now I'm gonna be possibly looking for um, what he's saying here. The more compelling reason, a stronger foundation. What is that? What is that stronger foundation, compelling reason? So that's what I'm gonna be looking for. And then of course, how does he do that? How does he make that argument? Okay. So it goes beyond. But again, uh, this is kind of important. It's a great constitutional right of freedom of speech. So why do we have this right besides just being able to tolerate the other side to blah, 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 whatever they want to say? We take, it seems to me, a naively self-righteous view when we argue as if the right of our opponents to speak were something that we protect because we are magnanimous. It seems to me a naively self-righteous view when we argue as if the right of our opponents to speak were something that we protect because we are magnanimous, noble, and unselfish. It cannot be about us. Okay, do you see what I'm saying there? Freedom of speech cannot be about us. Why? Because we're being self-righteous. If we're saying because we protect it because we're generous, we're noble. It's not about us. The principle goes beyond. The compelling reason why, if liberty of opinion did not exist, we should have to invent it. It must exist, right? Why it will eventually have to be restored in all civilized countries where it is now suppressed is that we must protect the right of our opponents to speak because we must hear what they have to say. It is a must. We have to hear. So it goes. it's a principle here beyond just they have rights. It's because we need it. So remember the title, The Indispensable Opposition. You cannot get rid, you must have uh, those in opposition to you, right? You must hear what they have to say. Now, is there a why for that? Why must we hear what they have to say? Well, possibly we're going to go on. We miss the whole point when we imagine that we tolerate the freedom of speech, freedom of our political opponents as we tolerate, now here's some imagery here, a howling baby next door as we put up with the blast from our neighbor's radio because we're too peaceable to heave a brick through the window, <laughs> okay? So a couple pieces of imagery right here. This goes back to is freedom of speech about me extending that and being generous to others so it's about me or is it because it is right because I need it, right? We don't need a howling baby next door. We don't need the annoyance of our neighbor's radio. Um, if this were all there was, we're too good natured or too timid to do anything about our opponents and our critics except to let them talk, it would be difficult to say whether we are tolerant because we're generous or because we're lazy. Tolerance calls into question motive, right? Am I being tolerant? Uh, in other words, they can speak. Not that I need it, not that I even care or want to hear. I'm just allowing them to speak and then I'm going to do what I want. That's a question of motive uh, because sometimes it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. So am I being lazy or am I being generous? You can't really know is what he's saying right here, right? Because we are magnanimous or because we're lazy, because we have strong principles or because we lack serious convictions. Whether we have the hospitality of an inquiring mind or the indifference of an empty mind. And so, if we truly wish to understand why freedom is necessary in a, in a civilized society, we must begin by realizing that because freedom of discussion improves our own opinions. Alright, so here's where you have to get down to 
what does he mean by this? Right? So connect these two things together. We must hear what they have to say here with this. And so this is what you sometimes have to do in a passage, right? Is connect the dots. This whole passage here leads to this. It improves our own opinions. You either refine your opinion to make concessions or consideration of what others may be saying, or you solidify your own viewpoint, you strengthen your own argument, you gain a better understanding of why you believe what you believe. So that's the whole second part of this, right? But this imagery here is kind of important. In other words, if you're just saying uh, it's important because it's a, it's a right, and right uh, is extended to you, and because you, you believe you have that right, then perhaps others should have that right as well. But in the end, it's really what I believe and what I think, uh, and that will reign supreme no matter what, versus... Understanding that hearing that idea or hearing that opinion actually helps you strengthen or refine your own ideas and opinions. So that's why the, the opposition becomes indispensable. All right. So this is the, that passage then. Uh, again, part of my goal here is not to give you all the answers. I'm not here to give you uh, exactly what to say in the piece. But to help you decode this passage to better understand it. All right, so hopefully that's what that did. If you do have comments or questions about anything I've said, or there's something I didn't go into enough depth for you, please put that in the comments and I'd be happy to respond to that. Uh, no problem, all right? Take care. Really appreciate you watching this video. It would be amazing. You're a fabulous person if you could subscribe to the channel. Here's a bunch of other videos that are writing workshops to help you deal with all kinds of facets of writing and growth as a writer. Uh, and then a couple other playlists that you might just find amusing or interesting or even helpful. Thank you so much. Until next time.